We come together today to deal with an ugly chapter in our nation's history. And we come together today to offer our nation's apology. To say to you, the forgotten Australians, that we are sorry. Sorry that as children you were taken from your families and placed in institutions where so often you were abused. Sorry for the physical suffering, the emotional starvation, and the cold absence of love, of tenderness, of care. Sorry for the tragedy, the absolute tragedy, of childhoods lost. Sorry for all these injustices to you as children who were placed in our care. You know, we did hope for an apology and we did get one. But we, you know, we believe that this stuff was powerful and it's damaged. And uh, an apology, the apology was wonderful but it's not enough. My mother couldn't afford to look after us, after me actually. It was fairly hard times back in the 40s. And a father had left mother, so therefore I was put into the home. Just going by my records, well, I was an 18 month old child when I went in. My mother died when I was about around three years of age. The fact that my father couldn't cope with raising us because there was 10 of us kids that he had to raise that he couldn't cope with, he couldn't manage. And us six youngest ones were institutionalised straight away and were signed over by him as, and we became wards of the state. My stepmother was pretty brutal. She used to actually make devices to, you know, hurt and um, do damage um, um, using things. And I ended up running away from home and uh, um, came under the notice of children's services back in those days. Australia, we found out, has the highest per capita history of placing children in care of any country in the world. My office okay. Okay. Yes. Right. I'll see you later. Thanks, Faye. Now, no one knows why. There's never been a reason given or an explanation, but we live with the legacy of that. So we were involved, and I was, it's one of the real honours in this job. Being a senator is a wonderful job, but one of the greatest things is the ability to work in committees. and a series of committees that will never leave my mind will be those that we dealt with on people who are in institutional care. Institutions, the state governments, the Australian governments, the British government, the Catholic Church, the, the Uniting Church, the Anglican Church, the Salvation Army, these institutions that hold a very prominent and powerful place in our society are actually at fault. So it makes a really big difference to people to have it on public record that there was a betrayal of trust when institutions that were set up to care for people actually harmed people. When I was picked from hundreds of children to go out to a normal family in, in a foster care situation, I was so happy. I was. I was over the moon. I could not believe it. I couldn't sleep. Oh, wow. I was going out into the world. So 
so then I was all spruced up and they put a nice little pretty dress on me and shoes and socks. Loved the shoes and socks because we never wore shoes and socks in the home unless visitors were coming, of course. <laughs> It was not a normal family, I have to say. They were bad, bad, bad. My stepfather there, well, I was sexually abused on a weekly basis. And what he used to put me through, I actually loathed that man. I could not loathe him any more than I did. I wanted to kill him. I wanted to be out of that situation. I wanted people to help me, but there was nobody to help me. And I was too afraid to tell my stepmother because she was so cruel. But one day I did get up the courage to try and tell her. I didn't know what to call it, how to speak about it. And in the end, she just gave me the biggest flogging of my life and said I was making up dirty stories. She did not believe me, and I vowed and declared that day in my mind that I would never, ever tell anybody again about what he was doing to me. I ended up in a, um, a home that was um, run by born-again Christians. The problem was the born-again Christian male in the house was also a bit of a pedophile, you know. So, uh, uh, so I had to warn this born-again Christian pedophile that if he touched me, you know, don't ever go to sleep again and feel comfortable because, you know, I knew what he was doing to everyone else. I ended up in youth detention, and uh, it's like prison, you know, like uh, upon entry, seven days solitary confinement, you know, like in a really dark room with food that was passed to you through this hole in the door and um, a pot tin bucket for a bathroom. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty awful. So, yeah, I got out of there as quickly as I could. I ended up breaking out of there. When I was uh, around seven, when I just long, not long got into that orphanage, you know, I started getting uh, sexually abused by this guy that was a police officer that was supposed to be there caring for us. Not only me being raped, but then having to witness others being raped. And it's like living with that, you know, and not being able to go and, and say anything for fear of being whipped or belted by the health parents if they heard us making a noise. So we always had to keep it quiet, even when we're being raped. You know, and I nearly died one night. When the guy that was abusing me, you know, well, like shoving his penis in my mouth, it's like I was gasping for breath and ready to die. And I felt like I was going to die and I just checked out of my body. And I knew I couldn't say a word, I couldn't scream and I couldn't go anywhere because he also had me pinned down with his other arm. It's like, you know, when that was happening, it's like something happens to you, you know, inside of you. And you go to another place and, and coming out of that, you know, Everything seemed different in the world, you know, and for some reason, you know, even though I, I nearly died, it was like I felt differently. Right. When the first Children's Commissioner was appointed in Queensland, the number of calls that the commissioner got for, from people who were adults saying that they experienced abuse as children was significant and the issue was really that you know the Children's Commission was set up to look at issues for children of the day not 
past issues. So Peter Beattie's government and Anna Bly was the minister of the then Department of Families and Community Care, set up what was referred to as a commission of inquiry to fully investigate what was the experience of abuse of children who were in state-run and church-run institutions. Throughout the 1990s, a very brave and courageous group of people in Queensland started to say, we had an experience in our childhood which was horrific and we want the public to know about it and we want to make sure that people understand how it happened and we want our experiences believed and validated and we want some confidence that it won't be happening again. Often it's very, very difficult to get to the heart of those issues without the full powers, of investigative powers of a commission of inquiry. Uh, so very, I think it was almost one of the first major decisions I made um, after I was sworn in as a minister in 1998 uh, to establish a Royal Commission of Inquiry to uh, hear these matters, to give people an opportunity to talk about them publicly, to give them public significance. That stuff that happened to me in those orphanages and that, you know, that really screwed me up, something chronic. You know, and I carried a lot of hatred for a long time. And I used to plan ways of, of how I was gonna kill these people and how I was gonna take them out. And uh, I got to a point where I just couldn't cope with all that mental torment and the emotional pain I used to suffer. You know, it just got that much for me that I couldn't cope with living. I, I used just about anything I could to try and survive, but Survival, I got to that point where survival was not living for me and I couldn't go on that way anymore. I didn't have any love myself. All I had as a child in the orphanage and in my foster care and in my adult life when I was living with my mother and her de facto husband, all I had was abuse. I spent decades of my life with abuse of men, the story of my life. It makes me angry, but, you know, it still blows my mind, you know. When I um, do think about this stuff, and a lot of stuff has come up for me recently, stuff that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> Because that's why you use drugs, you know? Because you need to try and stop thinking about things sometimes so you overload yourself as much as you can. And, you know, I've had uh, drug officers say to me, Beth, we never thought you'd make it out of your teens. We're just, you know, and, and here you are, you're still here. So, uh, I... Yeah, I, I'm a survivor and I'm proud about that. I was given a really bad prognosis of um, surgery that was done to my brain. You know, they said the maximum amount of time you've got is three years. I said to him, Karen was sitting with me in the room when I said to this neurosurgeon, but I said, but my daughter's only 17, she needs me. Can you make it five years? I don't even know why I said that. But I said, can you make it five years? And he, he sort of said, um, no, Beth, no. I'm 168. Hey, you 160. Last time. <laughs> oh, Beth. Hey, Beth. Hello. I'm Monica. I'm one of the nurses. How are you doing? Good. You're here for an MRI scan today. Yeah. Sort of faces. Um, have you had one? You've had one before. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Beth was diagnosed with a um, brain tumor three years ago and every so often we come up here for follow-up MRIs. Beth's actually undergone 
surgery, radium and chemotherapy, which she did really well. And uh, so this is just the follow-up. They told us that Beth would probably have six months to live. People need the support of others when they're going through that journey of trying to make sense of this. We still meet people who have never talked about it. The impact of um, being raised as a child in an institution and being harmed by that institution nor care and the people who are responsible for it has impacted, we know, greatly on people's ability to sustain their relationships as adults particularly intimate relationships and also their parenting because the emotional scars of that um, come up for them all the time as they relive their life as an adult. Oh, that's photo of me. That's me when I was a little boy. And it was, it's one of the only photos I've got of me as a child growing up in the orphanages. And I was uh, like just turning seven years old then, I think. I treasure it. It's the only thing I've got. <laughs> that says I was even in there, <laughs> you know, so, but yeah, I see he's, you know, like the little blokes in there, you know, that little bloke is in me, you know, and, I, and the qualities that he had are coming back into my life more now. And I spent, you know, virtually uh, as a state ward from the age of five, I think I was, till the age of 18, you know, and for those 13 odd years, you know, it was very difficult because there was so much abuse and neglect uh, and public shaming and, and constantly that it's taken me, you know, the last 35 years to heal that so that I could just be alive. Not so much about living and thriving and all that stuff. I've spent all this time just so that I could stay alive. And the other one is uh, my daughter, Kelly. We have, haven't had any contact now for the last six months. I just see the little girl in her, the little child, you know, like I can see that in my daughter. We've had a really estranged sort of relationship over the years, being a part-time dad, you know. She's now 23. She started going down the similar path I went, you know, with addictions and all that. My daughter never had the nurturing that I know is necessary for a baby to be able to grow into a healthy, functioning human being. And the effects of me not being able to be fully present there for my daughter, be a father and a healthy functioning father that participates in her life uh, and guides and, and teaches her things, that she's got this great big emptiness inside of her like I used to carry, that's not never been filled by a loving parent. If I had have had a mum around, you know, things might have been different for me and I wouldn't have grown up in orphanages and, you know, I wouldn't have been sexually abused or physically abused or raped or shamed or whatever, you know, and maybe my daughter wouldn't have to grow up like she has. I was married to two men who were abusive to me. They were abusive to my children as well. I was just a thing to be used. I wasn't, I didn't feel like a person until I had my children. That's when I became alive my own spirit. My children were important. I gave birth to children. They were my very own children. I, something, I felt I belonged to them. They belonged to me. The youngest son in my first marriage, he actually committed suicide last year. And um, he had been suffering great depression since the age of about 14. Some months later, when I read the, um, the report, the coroner's report, he had stated that he was being sexually abused by his stepfather, which was my second husband. And that was like a triple whammy. How's my little munchkin? How's my little munchkin? <laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. Up above the 
I have a, a beautiful relationship with the daughter I'm living with, Cassandra. She loves me very much and she's just had a, a new baby just recently and I just love that child. It brings back the memory of my children that I had all those years ago. Come and play with me. Is that right, Lockie? Oh, what is it? <laughs> I'm always... Went through a lot of anger knowing what Mum had been through her whole life mm -hmm. and even while she was married, her first husband abused her, her second husband abused her. Um, it's made me very wary of men. <laughs> I think you wanted to kill them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah. I don't trust men at all, really, because of it. Got pregnant quite young, I don't regret that at all, but my partner was abusive and I just thought I had to stay with him because I'd probably witness Mum stay with all her abusive partners, her two abusive husbands. And so I thought, well, there's, you know, I just got to stay together for the family because that's what Mum always used to say. You know, I stayed for the kids, I stayed together for the family. And then after about eight years of copying it, I realised, no, I don't have to. Uh, I saw a Dr Phil show one day, he said it's better to come from a broken home than live in a broken home, and it sort of clicked. I thought, I don't have to put up with this, and my kids will be a lot happier, I'll be a lot happier if I leave him. Mm. This is Jaden. He's nearly 15. That's my firstborn I had when I was two weeks off my 18th birthday. And that is his brother, Lockie. <laughs> what up? Say hello. Hello. And this is Lockie. He's going to be 12 in November. And he's very good at soccer. Look at Lockie. <laughs> Um, I met a guy on Oasis. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> oh, I thought he was quite nice and um, when I found out I was pregnant, the same day I found out I was pregnant to him, I had a gut feeling about something and I went through his phone and found out he was seeing someone else as well, which he denied and we had a big fight and I haven't seen him since. And he's never met his son. So I say the best way to break this cycle is to stay single, as far as I'm concerned, and just don't let anyone in. I also get angry, very angry, about what happened. And I think that what we have to do is ensure that it doesn't happen again. And that was certainly a message that came out in the two inquiries in which I was involved on this issue, because we did one and then we did another one to follow up on it. Uh, we have kids in care now, you know, through the process. We don't have the large institutions anymore, but we have care processes. What has to happen is that people have got to ensure that those care processes are caring. The core aspect was the need for a formal apology from our government to say it doesn't matter where you had this experience, it doesn't matter um, how old you were or who was the institution that you were in, you need to have an acknowledgement that we failed. As a community, as, as a government, we failed. The Government of Australia will move the following motion of apology in the Parliament of Australia. Do you want so, me to make a pot of tea? Yes, please, Bob. Oh, this is such a beautiful tea cup, eh? Yeah, just got it. But anyway. Nice colours. Yeah. And you know what? I didn't like orange or green much before I had the brain tumour. Since I've had the brain tumour and left the hospital and everything, I really discovered, oh, I actually like orange, and gee, I actually like green too, you know? <laughs> and I never used to like that much, and I reckon it's got something to do with that brain tumour and the altruism of... I know there's been an alteration in my brain, you know? Do you know what I would say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And I... And it didn't Beth work. helped form the Historical Abuse Network. Um, well, she was involved pre the Ford inquiry, so advocating for an inquiry into abuse. Beth was one of the three that met with um, representatives from the, de the Department of Families, sometimes the Department of Premiers, 
um, and, and advocated with every minister. Beth Wilson was one of a group of people who I regard as enormously courageous. Uh, these were very painful and difficult and traumatic experiences to talk about. Uh, so I have uh, enormous admiration for them and, and just drew inspiration from uh, their ability to speak out in the most difficult of circumstances. You know, they had very powerful people on the other side, you know, bishops of churches coming out saying, these people are not telling the truth. And, you know, they didn't get deterred by that. People like Beth just kept telling the truth. and until they convinced people, you know. Uh, it, was very, it was a very emotional and powerful experience. Unless they had been prepared to share their stories and talk about deeply personal and difficult issues, it would never have got the public attention it got because that's really what compelled people and made it impossible for the public to look away. And this was all new to me, you know, like I'd been involved with the women's movement, but not with the heavyweights, you know, running the state, you know, uh, and, uh, it, you know, or playing a role in the running of the state. And so, yeah, I, that was amazing to have an impact on a minister that had an impact on this issue. It's been a while since you had the MRI. Yeah. How are you feeling about getting the results? Well, I, I was feeling really, really good, but I've had a couple of really, really intense, like, intense headaches, but it's not even a headache because it's so sharp. I've got to find more to do, you know, like, yeah. I intend to freaking still be here. The whole issue of people who experienced abuse in out-of-home care in Australia will be a deep wound in the Australian community forever because, you know, it's never... It, whilst it's got some response and the apologies and the state and common Australian government's response has gone some way towards really being able to measure the, you know, impact for some people, there are others that it hasn't. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. I'm good. I'm good. Dennis, this is Gloria. I don't know if you two have met before. No, no I don't no. think so. No. no. I, uh, Beth, uh, unfortunately, isn't able to come today. She's um, not feeling very well, which um, she came in earlier on this morning, but felt that she needed to go home. Uh, I'll right there. <laughs> Thank you. We look back with shame that so many of you were left cold hungry and alone and with nowhere to hide and nobody, absolutely nobody to whom to turn. We acknowledge today that the laws of our nation failed you. And for this, we are deeply sorry. So let us together as a nation, allow this apology to begin to heal this pain. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, fine. What did you think of this? You haven't seen it before, so... No, I've heard snippets of it, but... Uh, for me, it was, it was good that the, the government, like the head of, the, of this country, is actually acknowledging mm. what happened to us. You know, so it's not in the closet anymore. Mm. It's exactly. like it's been validated. You know, and I, I think that that's why it's so important for um, things like the apology and to remember it, to make sure that it stays on the political agendas at both the state and the federal level to keep, you know, fighting for yeah. the services and support that forgotten Australians require. I look forward to coming here. I know. Hello. Come in, have a seat. Thank you. One of the things that we do is support the children, uh, grandchildren of former residents that may access this service. Um, I've 
been How involved. How would that work? Well, it works in lots of different ways. It's about in individually. Yeah. Um, so well, say, for example, if my daughter suffering with chronic depression mm -hmm. and that is needing some sort of counselling and yeah. support, is that available to yeah. her? Through the Aftercare Resource Centre. I know my daughter, you're talking about your daughter, I know my daughter many times I mm. told her you can get counselling mm. uh, because she was dealing with my stuff mm. that I was going through. Well, look where it got Daniel. Yeah. You know, I wasn't able, you know, it wasn't my fault um, no. that he had. All those problems. Yeah. You know, I wasn't, you know, I used to say to him sometimes, talk to me, Daniel, talk to me. But, um, but I wasn't able to help him deal with stuff that he had been through and I, I don't know, I, I felt inadequate. Oh good. It's relief. <laughs> <laughs> Good news, there's been no further growth um, in the tumour, but because it's um, such a, um, a nasty tumour, we have to have, Beth has to have another MRI in three months. Oh, oh wow. I know. I'm going to have to sleep for most of the week. Can we get out of here? <laughs> I know you haven't been able to sleep for most of the week, but you'll sleep well tonight. policies are broken, when there is harm done by institutions that are meant to do good, that they're accountable and a Human Rights Act for Australia would be a really important way of doing that. Rather than every state having to influence policy makers, get people around the table, it's depending on the quality and the ability of those people to actually understand why this is so important and to believe that there should be some justice in response. If we could recreate Lotus Place in every major community, we will have had a wonderful victory. Um, the Lotus Place Network, the wonderful work there where people have a place of safety, where they know they will get support, where they know they will have a network who understands. That kind of service is desperately needed everywhere. I know when I spoke to many people who were involved and gave evidence at the inquiry, they wanted they wanted many things, but one of the two most common themes was that they wanted to have their story heard and believed, and they wanted to feel that if telling their story, 
because it was painful for them, they would help protect another child from going through something similar. So I think that's a really important long-term legacy.